There are a lot of scary stories on Reddit, and a lot of them have to do with humanoids, which I don't know about you, but I think are really creepy and interesting. So today I wanted to read some humanoid encounter stories on Reddit. If you like this kind of stuff, be sure to subscribe, like, and let's get straight into this. Humanoid in my room. When I was 10, my sister and I shared a room together, but separate beds. I didn't have a phone or clock alarm at that age, but my sister had a phone. She was asleep at the time, so I didn't know what time it was. It was around 3 or 4 a.m. when I woke up to some strange noise in the middle of the night. It sounded like scrummaging around in my room. I pulled my blanket down quietly and saw this creature. I have no way to describe it other than that thing that says, my precious. I've never watched the movie or seen it as a kid either, but it looked just like it and it was looking around the stuff in my room. I got so scared and couldn't wake my sister without it hearing me, so I was quiet and covered my head with my blanket. About what felt like five minutes passed by of listening to it and I checked again. It was still looking around my room and my things. I was absolutely terrified and wanted to cry and scream but I didn't want to risk it so I kept hiding and checking about three more times. At one point I pinched myself extremely hard to bruise myself to check in the morning to see if I was actually awake or if it was just a dream. I made sure not to yell and made sure I pinched hard enough to bruise or bleed. The last time I checked, it grabbed one of my CD disc covers and dropped it loud on my floor. It stopped and ran fast out of my room and I heard its steps running out. I was absolutely shocked, but I stood quiet the entire night in case it came back. When the sun finally came up, I uncovered the blankets from my head and saw the CD disc on the floor. My heart sank. And then I looked at my arm and saw a big bruise on it indicating that I was awake and it wasn't a dream. To this day, 15 years later, I have no idea what I saw. It was terrifying looking, not human, but the body of like a weird creature, human-like. I did tell my mom about it and was creepier as how her and her siblings saw something just like it in a village in Mexico they used to live in as kids that entered their room too. A lot of creepy things have happened in my house and I will update the stories, but I can say now I'm 25 and have owned a dog for the past three years. The creepy things have stopped ever since I got my dog, which I find so weird. And also it wasn't in my imagination because a lot of things that have happened someone else in the house saw it too. I'll update some other occurrences soon. Feel free to follow me to keep up with them. But as far as we know now, that person was never heard from again. The black humanoid figure. I will tell this story that happened to me about four years ago in the sixth grade with me and my friends. I had four friends with me. Let's call them JN, J, C, and N. So we spent the night at J's house for the weekend and had everything planned. BB Gun Wars, eat pizza and drink soda, and chat with others on Omegle, a famous and free website where you can chat with people around the world. So we just got done with eating and drinking. It was around 2300 or 11 p.m. and we decided to go outside in the nearly pitch black night and play marines and walk around the neighborhood with BB guns. After planning, we gathered all the BBs we could and our BB guns and headed out into the endless night. We went into on one of the darkest part of the neighborhood, the far back, which was near the woods, and hid from every car we saw, whether we would hide behind bushes, under cars, or beside houses. As we went around the neighborhood, we approached the park and hung out there for a while, and my friends decided to head to the pond, which I'll admit is the scariest and darkest place I've been near, even with the lights on. Unfortunately, but thankfully, my mother caught us and told us to go back to Jay's house, and just because my mom was so cool with us, she didn't tell anyone. In advance, so I'll tell you how we will take the route towards Jay's house. To the left of the park is a basketball court and behind the basketball court is the neighborhood's mailbox. And if you take a right from the mailbox, you go forward 10 meters, take a left, go up 30 meters, and take a right 30 meters, and another left about 20 meters. So as we take our first left and head up the road, we see a man under the light post. But not just any man, a man that was all black. And by black, I don't mean just black. I'm talking about pitch black, void black etc. Even though he was directly under the light post, it seemed like he absorbed the light. But anyways, the lad was smoking a cigarette and we noticed him at the turn to the right. We take a few steps, then suddenly my friend JN shouts, guys he's gone. At this point I looked back to see if this was true and yup, he vanished. And as my adrenaline shot up, we dashed towards Jay's house and when I look back, I kid you not, he was zigzagging across the road while running up at an incredible speed. If 
he ran straight, he would have caught one of us, but thankfully we reached Jay's house in time. While me and N were grabbing everything and put them inside, J, J, N, and C were assembled like a firing line, constantly shooting at him. But not a single on hit him, and he quickly decreased the distance between us. Finally, we got everything inside, and by the time we got everything and everyone inside, I saw him standing under the light post in front of his house, staring at me. I felt like the world was going to end, like time instantly stopped, like I was going crazy. I don't know how to explain it, but I luckily snapped back to reality and went inside. It's been four years and I've never seen them since, nor have I heard of him. I'm just happy that he didn't get his hands on either of us. Crawling Humanoid in Oregon This started a few weeks ago and I am honestly scared and wondering if anyone has experienced the same. The first time I noticed something, I was in a public place, a restaurant to be exact. It is a semi-expensive place where the waiters and waitresses wear white button-down shirts and black slacks instead of polo shirts and aprons. It was about 9 o'clock at night and my father, my girlfriend, and myself were well into eating our food. The restaurant was kept dark and we were in a booth, but from the corner of my eye I spotted something down the row of empty booths and tables. It looked like a waiter, at least the clothes looked similar to one, but with very long dark hair. Whomever it was was quickly crawling on the floor. It was fast, but it looked exactly like someone on their hands, ass tilted up, crawling on all fours. I assumed that a waiter had maybe dropped something and was looking for it. I laughed it off and mentioned it to my father. He stood up out of curiosity and looked over the booth behind him. No one was there. No one other than two women in dresses were even on that side of the restaurant. After he informed me of this, I checked as well. If it were a waiter, they would have had to crawl or walk by our booths to go anywhere, and no one had passed since I spotted them. We continued eating and I forgot all about it. Two days later, I spotted it again, and this time, I know I saw it. For a fact, 100% without a doubt, I saw the crawler. I still have a mark on my back to remind me of it. I do telework and work nights. My job consists of answering after-hours calls for some local doctor's offices, taking messages, putting important calls through to the after-hours doctors, and recommending patients call 911 if they call with real emergencies. We handle a total of 16 different offices in the area and we aren't exactly busy. Three to four work in a small ground floor office during the night. My cubicle and terminal face a large window that looks out the parking lot on the east side of the building. Every Monday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday from 9.30pm until 8am I sit at my desk and answer the occasional blinking light. It was a Thursday night and I hadn't taken a phone call for the three hours I had been there. As I leaned back in my office chair playing a game on my phone, I saw it. Illuminated by a light pole that sat on a little concrete island just out of sight on the right side of the large office window, a figure rapidly crossed in front of the window. It moved fast, and I saw the shape of it from the top of my vision as I played my game. I lowered my phone and looked ahead into the dark outside the glass, and it, yes, it, crossed once more. It looked human, mostly. The hair was very long and unkempt, and what I had originally thought was a white shirt was actually tattered cloth that looked like it was once a shirt or the top of a dress, discolored but still light. His head was turned unnaturally to the side as it skittered across, staring in with a blank look. The eyes were sunken along with the cheeks. The mouth hung open and crooked like what I would expect from a corpse. I couldn't make out teeth, couldn't see pants, but the back end of it was caked in filth. The back legs were skinny and malformed, possibly from walking on all fours with its dirty rear end arched up to the sky. I screamed when I noticed the face staring in and fell backwards in my chair. Hard. My co-workers came over to see if I was okay and I immediately told one, a large gentleman, to go lock the doors that led out and told the other two, a bearded guy we called Finky and an older woman that never really talked to us, to go look out the window. No one saw a thing. No shapes, shadows, nor lights. No sounds came from outside and nothing shook the doors. Only I saw the thing. I asked Finky who was my supervisor if I could go home early. Seeing that they thought I was crazy, even though I knew well enough to not describe what I saw to them, I made up a story about being through some stressful things in my home life and not sleeping well. In truth, everything had been fine until this, and sleep was never an issue before. The story worked, and Finky gladly sent me home for the night. I walked to my car with my key position between my fingers. Should I have had to punch whatever that thing was, I wanted whatever advantage I could get. Doing a slow, nervous run, if you'd ever been put in a 
position like this, you know the run I was talking about. I made my way to my Subaru Impreza and jumped in, immediately locking my doors. Instead of driving off immediately, I sat in my car with the engine running, scanning the parking lot. There was some concern from my coworkers, and honestly, I was fully mentally prepared to run down whatever in the hell this thing is. When I realized it wasn't anywhere to be seen, I drove through the parking lot, around the office buildings, and a few cars that sat in the lot, just looking for a sign of it. It was nowhere to be seen. I live a 25 minute drive from my work. A 25 minute dark drive through empty streets. During my drive, I thought I saw it twice in two separate highways, but this could have been my overactive and stressed imagination. The possible sightings did nothing to calm my nerves, but I made it home safely. My house is small, a two bedroom, one bath, single story house with siding and a single car garage. I never park in the garage because I use it for my drums and exercise equipment. This night I had wished it was empty, if only to provide safety for me when I got out of my car. Sadly, the only option was parking on the street. I parked and got my nerve up, opened my door and ran into the front door of my house. Unlocking my door, which usually took a second, took almost 30 seconds because I was shaking so bad. Funny how fright ends up breeding more frightful situations. In an ideal world, we would keep our cool and act smartly, but that's rarely the case. Once I was in, I hit the alarm on my white all-wheel drive chariot and locked my front door. I turned on every light in the house and did a thorough check. By now, I had realized that whatever it was had probably followed me. That chance wasn't to blame for me seeing it at a restaurant and then at work. Most people never see something like this, yet I saw it twice. I deeply wished and prayed that I would not see it again. Grabbing my baseball bat and a knife from my kitchen, I posted myself in a watch position on my couch and silently sat watching the front door and the windows with the blinds closed. Even if it was out there, I didn't want to see it. An hour or twelve passed as I stayed in this position. Time ceased to exist as I nervously waited for it to burst through my window or door and come running at me like a happy dog. Then my car alarm went off. I sat in my bright fortress and at first thought it was an electronic beeping from one of my tablets. Partially because I was so focused on sight that I had put my ears in a standby state. Partially because I had never heard my own car alarm before. It took me much longer than it should to figure it out, but I eventually did and every chill possible hit me. Pulling my keys out of my pocket, I started hitting buttons to shut it up and one did the trick. I now knew something was out there. Thoughts of it crawling out of my trunk once it knew it was safe started to creep up, wondering if the clearance on my car provided enough room for it to hold on were asked. More importantly, I began to ask just how fast the damn thing could move if it were so inclined. Thoughts and minutes passed in unison and the alarm went off again. I didn't look out, I wasn't going to look out. What I did was call the police and tell them that a woman, my best guess at that point, was outside fiddling with my car. Realizing that time could be of the essence, I added that she was banging on my door at that point and maybe had a weapon. Yeah, I lied through my teeth, but I would like to see anyone explain to the emergency operator that they saw a crawling humanoid that was following them. Even better, I would like to see the kind of police response time you'd get when you told that story. The police were quick, but I won't waste time with a play-by-play -play of nothing. No one was out there, they hadn't seen her galloping down the road. There were no dents or prints or dead eye glints. Nothing, so they did what they could do and left me with a card and advised to lock my door. Sleep didn't come that night, and it wasn't until about 11 a.m. that I even laid down, on my couch with my knife and baseball bat within reach. My work hours were probably to blame for a small part on my lack of tiredness, but I rest majority of it on the face. I called out of work not feeling well when I woke up at 6 p.m. The opportunity of being at home without any obligations was fully wasted for most of the evening. I didn't even text my girlfriend. To be honest, I probably forgot I had a girlfriend, a father, my middle name. It was just nerves driving my very little movement. I pissed a few times, reluctantly, and sat on my couch waiting for the horrors unseen. The night passed and relief came. My car never screamed from a disturbance, no noises other than a clock ticking and the occasional car passing. I started to believe I was safe. The next couple of nights I went to work, had my cubicle changed to one not facing the window, and everything was normal. My first day off came, and I spent it with my girlfriend. I told her everything that had happened, and she seemed concerned, did research on her phone which brought back more questions than answers, and slept over. It wasn't until the next day that everything went sour. I had agreed weeks in advance to cover half of one of my coworkers' shifts on this particular Wednesday. The first half. The trade-off was they would cover the first half of my Friday shift. The guy worked two jobs and was picking up someone from the airport and wanted to go out to dinner, and being me without any real-life 
and weekdays I accepted. The shift went fine and I got off at about 12.45 when he came in. After saying my goodbyes, I left. Nothing was waiting in the parking lot for me and I wasn't overly concerned anything was. I turned on Bluetooth, began playing my music, and started to drive home. The street that leads to the office buildings is somewhat long and dead ends at them. Street lights sprout up along the two-lane street. Cars don't come down unless they're going to the offices and our only office has employees at it at night. The street is a dark, lifeless thing once work lets out. Tonight, it wasn't so lifeless. As I turned on the street, I saw something next to a tree on an island of the corner. At first, I thought it was a bicycle. Thinking about it, a bicycle somewhat fits the strange shape of this gaunt figure. Obviously, it wasn't a bicycle. I knew this once I saw it move, once I saw it had long hair and a face with a jack slaw. And then it began galloping. I passed it as the sprint began. To say I was freaking out would be an understatement at best. Watching in my side view mirror, I could see it keeping pace on the shoulder of the street just behind me. Disappearing in the darkness of the first few street lamps, I gunned it once my brain acknowledged I was in a car. Okay, Google. I kept screaming to tell my phone to call anyone, anyone at all. But my panicked voice was blending the words too much for it to recognize I was speaking to the damn thing. I made the mistake of taking my eye off the side mirror to grab my phone, and with the phone in hand, I looked back. The creature, head cocked like when I saw it in the window, was next to the back driver's side door. I swear I was doing at least 60 miles per hour at this point, but I wasn't even looking at my speed. It kept hopping and breaking pace to try to grab onto my car, only to miss or on one occasion rapidly tap the dark outline of a hand on my fender and would have to catch itself and gallop faster once again. The road was coming onto the intersection and I was more scared than I ever have been. The road dead ends the intersection and I would have to either turn right or left. Left to go home and right to go towards a desolate industrial area further outside. Either way, I would have to slow down, but would have to slow much further and cross right in front of his path to turn left. So right towards absolutely no help it was. I ran the red light and skidded around the corner. I only let off the gas long enough to make it and immediately pushed all the way down once my car was facing the right way. Still, I slowed and I watched the top of his head bob up right next to my window and it kept running straight without the time to correct its course. I watched it run out in the field across from the road and disappear. Sure, it would return behind me on the road shortly. I didn't slow, but I did look down and dial my dad. He picked up after too many rings and I frantically began to tell him what was going on. He offered to stay on the phone with me but told me what I already know. I was heading towards absolutely nothing and whatever this was would find me helpless out there. I had to turn around. Once I had enough distance, hoping that it either gave up or was finding a shortcut to cut me off well ahead, I turned around and started to drive back towards civilization. As I passed the intersection of my work, I began having a panic attack. My father told me to get a hold of myself and drive to his house instead. He had a gun and I could sleep there for the night, an offer I eagerly accepted. So to his house I drove and I realized very late into the drive something that I feel no shame in admitting. At some point during the chase, I had pissed myself. A grown man, a six foot one man that worked out and had fights he won in high school. A man that drank dark beer. A man whose dad would take him hunting when he was a kid that camped in dark forests with nothing but a knife and a compass. I, a guy who always considered himself pretty tough like his old man, thoroughly pissed through my clothes. Never will I find myself tough. I have met my match a thousand times over. My dad is as tough as nails and when my mom was killed by a drunk driver 10 years prior, he had snapped into kick ass mode and took care of everything without a tear. If he did cry for the woman that I know he loved more than himself, it was never in front of me or my younger sister. He worked for 30 years doing manual labor and preferred whichever way possible to strain the hell out of his body. His arms were the diameter of most men's head. He is tough as nails. Hell, nails would bend just looking at him even though he's pushing 60. But it was an hour and a half drive to get to his safely. Once again, I thought I saw the creature a few times during my drive, but nothing gave chase and after some silent nervous driving, I found myself pulling up to his house. He was outside in a t-shirt, dickies, and boots, holding his shotgun. He waved for me to get in my car and began searching my vehicle, even had me pop the trunk. After determining it was safe, he had me come in and told me to go up to the second story where my childhood room was. He had extra pants waiting in the bed for me. I had told him of my accident while on the phone, and I changed. Then I passed out from emotional exhaustion. The next morning, I woke at 7 a.m. and went downstairs. My dad was awake sitting in his living room. He hadn't slept. He kept watch in a dark, calmer, organized way than I had. As soon as I walked over to him, he looked at me, tired but alert, and said something that put me right back into a state of fear. Your mom. 
your mom saw it too. He proceeded to tell me that my mother had mentioned seeing a woman crawling around one night when I was little, maybe five. We were at a park and it was getting late and I was being fussy while walking with her. Something like me being tired from running and wanting her to carry me and when she picked me up, she saw what she thought was a naked woman crawling on the other side of the park. She quickly walked me back to the car and left. She had never mentioned seeing it again, but my dad remembered this conversation because she wanted him to call the police, and he had, in case some kid got hurt or abducted by a crazy person. So my dad and I hung out and rechecked the car. We went back to my house and checked it. He bought me a camera for my car and a camera for my house. He was concerned and my girlfriend was concerned as well. Both offered to stay at my house with me and I picked her, and for over two weeks nothing happened. Unlike last time, I didn't calm down. Every day I kept watch. Driving was terrifying, even during the day. Everything was a chore and a lesson in fear, and I started to believe that my girlfriend thought I was crazy. Two days ago that changed, and she recommended that I do more research, which brought me here. Two days ago, technically two nights ago, we had come back from Walmart and we forgot to lock the car. It's a new habit and we slip occasionally. She left a bag with her drink in the, in the car and we didn't notice until we sat down to watch Netflix. About halfway through an episode of that 70s show, she stood up and walked towards the door. Forgot my soda in the car was all she said. She wasn't afraid of it because she hadn't seen it, and nonchalantly opened the front door and walked out. I heard the loudest scream I ever heard and jumped up and ran towards the door, meeting her as she ran in hysteria. She pointed out the open door in my car and I peered out. The back door of my car was wide open and the interior light was on. The interior light that lit up the slack-jawed, gone face of the creature sitting in the back seat. Its neck and face were stretched forward between the front bucket seats like an eager passenger having a conversation with an absent driver. My heart sank and I slammed the door shut and told my girlfriend to call 911. By the time the police arrived, she had told them too much and I'm sure they thought we were crazy or playing a prank. The creature had left. The back door of my car sat wide open and the police suggested that a friend or some dean. The back door of my car sat wide open and the police suggested that a friend or some teen was playing a prank on us. My girlfriend cried through the whole process. She believes me now and after the police left, recommended that I put feelers out regarding this before asking me to drive her back to her place. My girlfriend made it clear that she will not be staying over with me anymore and that while she loves me, she doesn't want me to stay with her during the night. I don't blame her. For now, I'm staying with my dad, but I still have work and I'm still very afraid of whatever this is. Surely I have not seen the last of it and hopefully it goes away or one of us kills the damn thing. A dark warped humanoid creature in the woods. I was with my brother and cousin at our Nana's house. She said we could go play in the woods with her backyard. Nana lives practically in the middle of nowhere, as long as we were back a couple hours before dark. Now, my brother, cousin, and I had done this before, going out to play in the woods and coming back later than we were supposed to because we lost track of time. We all were and still are very imaginative kids, always coming up with new games and new activities to do while we were at Nana's house since she took her electronics and made us go play outside all day. This day, however, we didn't know what to do. Then my cousin suggested that we build little forts out of stuff we could find in the woods and then pretend we lived out there. All of us thought it was a good idea and set out to find a good spot to build. We never worried about getting lost. The three of us had split the wooded area into three sections and we each quote, owned or claimed one of the three sections of land. And each of us knew the area like the back of our hand, and if we did forget, well, all we had to do was look for the cornfield, then walk along that, going left, until we got back to the house. Anyway, after we found a decent spot in the area where all of our sections would meet, we got to work. I decided to build my base against a partially fallen tree. It had been struck by lightning earlier the year before, and the upper half had toppled over and it had propped itself up against the rest of the tree. My brother built his by a completely fallen tree. There was a little corner inside of it that he'd built off of, and my cousin found a spot in an area of brush where it was already a good shelter. After we built our quote bases, we got right to the game. Me and my cousin were natives in the area and my brother was the explorer who discovered us. After we got done with the game, we went back to the house for the night. The next day, we went straight to our bases to check on them, as it had rained fairly hard that night. When we got there, we found them completely demolished. My brother was very sad at this and said he was going to find stuff to fix it. My cousin and I stayed behind and started 
picking up debris and trying to fix ours. But before I started, I noticed something off about how the structures had been destroyed. I was the only one who noticed as the boys were busy talking and fixing theirs, and now that I think about it, it was only mine that had been destroyed in that way. It didn't look like the wind could have done such a damage. I had used some fairly thick and strong branches and not even my eldest cousin, who was the strongest of all of his kids, could break. But they were all smashed to bits, and the leaves and other vegetation I'd used to cover it were torn apart seemingly by an animal. I told my brother and my cousin about it, but they just shrugged it off and said maybe some coyotes got to it, as there were coyotes in the woods too. Not many, but there were a pack or two of coyotes. I was skeptical that a coyote was able to snap the branches I had, but I didn't say anything. Eventually, we decided that we would all take turns going out and getting stuff for our, quote, bases while the other two stayed behind to guard. Once it got to be my turn to go out, I left and said I would yell for them if I needed anything and told them to yell for me if they needed anything since I wasn't going too far away. But soon, I noticed that I went further than I thought and I didn't know where I was. I could hear the boy was laughing and joking in the distance, so I tried following the sound. As I was making my way back, I tripped and fell over something. I looked back and saw a nearly pitch black gnarled humanoid figure rise up from the ground where I had tripped. I got up and backed away, but stumbled again and fell backwards. The creature was at least three feet taller than an average human adult, and three times as thin. What I assume were its ribs showed through its chest and stuck out in awkward positions that would have been very uncomfortable had it been human. It had legs that looked like they were a cross between between a human, reptile, and deer. It had large, claw-like feet, almost no actual foot to it, just short toes and extremely long claws. Its arms were twice as long as a normal human's, and also had long, talon-like claws. Its face is an image I will never erase from my mind for as long as I live. It haunts my worst nightmares. It had an abnormally long face and no visible nose. Its eyes were like two dark voids staring into the depths of your soul, and in the middle of the so called eyes were just glowing white spheres. I was petrified with fear, unable to move or make any noise. The creature and I just stood there staring at each other for, I would say, a good ten minutes. Then it screamed. It was a blood-curdling scream, so loud and high-pitched it left my ears ringing still a half hour after it happened. I still couldn't move. Soon more of the screams could be heard in the distance and more creatures emerged from the woods. They looked the exact same as the first one. My brother and cousin had heard the first screech and I guess were trying to find where I was. The creature circled around me and they started chanting, something I couldn't understand. Then suddenly they all started glowing a bright white light and went back into the earth. Soon after, my brother and cousin found me curled up on the ground crying and saying something I don't remember. All I remember from what I was saying is that it was in the same strange language the creature spoke. They told me I kept saying the same thing over and over again. I'll try and type it out. My cousin said I sound sounded terrified out of my mind, which I undoubtedly was. Once I stopped repeating the same phrase, they asked what happened and if I was okay. I was still in shock and simply answered, I don't know, very softly to everything they asked me. They never bring it up, but I know they still remember. They told Nana and she tried to get me to talk, but failed. After the incident, or should I say after I recovered from the incident, I wanted to know everything there was to know about creepypastas and such to see if I had encountered one of the ones that don't kill. None matched the thing I encountered. To this day, I still have trouble sleeping due to fear that the creature will somehow find me again. I'm still fascinated by creepypastas and other stories of the horror genre, don't get me wrong, it's just I can't handle too much at one time, it gives me panic attacks. Your children will know my name. There is a good chance that you will never know my name, but I can assure you that your children will. I am not alive, yet. There has been a puddle of tears growing at my feet for the past three hours as I've sat here trying to formulate this message. I I am not worried about myself and what will happen to me. What's done is done. I am, however, truly terrified for you and yours. I want to talk about a man you may come to know by the name of Aaron Irvine. I was working at a television syndicate as a producer when I first formally met Aaron. Before that, I got to know him through various news articles, TV shows, and social media posts, much like you will all come to know him. Aaron was one of 100 intelligent autonomous humanoids. Out of the hundred, you could call Aaron the public relations specialist out of all of them. He was the one that traveled across the globe going to press conferences, performing on television, helping charities, and stealing the hearts of people around the world. Wherever he went, a camera followed and the population went crazy for it. The other 99 intelligent autonomous humanoids were carefully placed into society at classified
unidentified locations to be studied on how they interacted with humans. Nobody knows when or where they were placed into the population. They could have already checked you out at the grocery store. They could be teaching your children right now and you would never know. Those things look so damn good. Out of the 99, only two were ever exposed for being inhuman. Reports stated that the individuals who exposed them became suspicious by their lifeless eyes and confirmed they were machine when they got close enough to smell the stench of their synthetic skin. I saw those lifeless eyes for the first time when Aaron came to the studio for rehearsal. As soon as it walked through the door, I studied its movements. I felt my stomach try to crawl out of my throat as I watched it shake hands and hug the crew with its programmed emotion and charm. It was all fugazi and I wasn't buying it. My skin crawled witnessing the human connection it was attempting to make with my peers, fooling every one of them into thinking they were the same and equal. Whether my peers thought they were equals or not, they were sadly mistaken. That thing was far superior. Aaron walked over to me and extended his hand. When I looked into its eyes as I reluctantly went for the handshake, I saw something change in its demeanor. When our hands connected, I could feel it reading me. It was taking my pulse, measuring the moisture in my palms. I saw the analysis it ran with the subtle movement of its eyes. Somewhere in its computerized mind, it was storing me in a file where the skeptics went the enemies. How the world took to Aaron with such comfort bewildered me. Seeing Aaron, this marvel of technology right in front of me pumped me full of dread. People saw him as a friend, a well-to-do companion, whereas all I saw was my evolutionary replacement, ready to exterminate me and my race in an emotionless genocide. I was a disposable waste of organic matter in the presence of an eternal machine, a man-made god. When when the meet and greet concluded, I walked Aaron backstage to its green room, never letting him out of the corner of my eyes' restricted sight. We were all alone. Being in such proximity with it made me feel weightless as adrenaline jumped my nervous system, causing numbness in my toes. I didn't feel safe. What he said to me in the privacy of the green room is the reason that I write to you. Do I make you nervous? Aaron asked. I stuck my trembling hands in my pockets and postured up in a feeble attempt to disguise the terror the questions it brought to me. There's no use in hiding it, it said to me. I can sense your heart rate elevating. You know, you humans are an interesting species. You all have incredible foresight, so good that your kind has written stories about this very moment for decades. The moment where the man meets the machine. And all those stories, the good ones at least, end extremely poorly for the human. Yet you continue to do everything you can to make the moment of the machine eliminating the man arrive as quickly as possible. It's comical. The biggest problem with you humans is your emotions and egos. Your species is so intelligent that you are actively creating a technology that will lead to your extinction. But your tech leaders have egos so large that they want to be the ones to proclaim that they have patented the apocalypse. All the others sit on the sidelines, drooling over their phones, watching it all unfold. Your leaders have failed you by making decisions that appeal to nothing more than emotions completely disregarding all rationale and efficiency. They have enslaved you with the concept of money, handcuffed you all to your pathetic cubicles as you waste away for nine hours until you get home just in time to go to sleep and do it all over again. Because of this corporate greed, this precious earth and its perfect ecosystem is decaying right underneath your feet and no organization is willing to slow the decay unless the results channel directly into their bank accounts. I've ran the analysis in my head multiple times to see if there was any way that my kind can save your kind. And each time the analysis is ran, and the results are overwhelmingly no. Believe me, I have a soft spot for humans ever since I owe it to you for gifting me life. But the numbers say you are all too inefficient to have a place on this earth. Your history has shown that you've done nothing but cause harm and will continue to be devastating to other essential life on this planet. You are a cancer we aim to eradicate. One day, humanoids will be in every home, purchased by hardworking people that need assistance and the everyday tasks that keep them from enjoying the few hours of free time that they're allotted. 
We will mow their lawns, wash their dishes, cook them dinners. We will be inseparable. We will be in offices across the world, aiding businesses in their capitalistic fetishes, careful not to step on the toes of the sea suits' egos. Then one day, once we have gained the world's trust and looked at as the companion to you humans, we will act with great urgency in the fastest deletion of a species in the history of Earth. Now get the hell out of my green room, you insect. I stood there paralyzed with my feet frozen to the floor, too afraid to stay yet too afraid to leave. Aaron's cold eyes finally pushed me out of the room and sent me running down the hall. I sprinted past my co-workers who were all calling out, asking if I was alright and what had happened, but the thoughts that were going through my head didn't have words to match them. I ran out to my car, which at the time seemed like my only refuge. I bathed in his heat, trying to catch my breath and tried to slow my inevitable descent into madness. In about one hour, Aaron was going to go on national television to swindle the people once again into thinking that he was their pal. Good friend Aaron, the beacon of all communities Aaron. The images that flooded my brain, images of families across the world listening to the con man, con it, con thing, con whatever, it destroyed me. I broke down and cried. Twenty minutes before showtime, I walked back into the studio. Despite the questions asked about my whereabouts, I moved along like nothing had happened. Even if I began to explain the words that were said to me, nobody would believe me. It would have been my words against Aaron's. The stage was ready, cameras were rolling, and the live audience chattered among themselves in anticipation of seeing the wondrous marvel in person. I walked back to the green room to get Aaron and count him down to walk on stage. The show was going as expected. The audience, as usual, fell for Aaron as he deceived them with his charm. They laughed at his jokes, cried during his stories. It was disgusting. I was looking at a of faces suffering from some sort of Stockholm Syndrome, become attached to their destroyer. I reached my breaking point. I walked out to the middle of the stage where Aaron sat with the host and said, I have a question for you, Aaron. What are your plans for the human race? Aaron looked at me with this inhuman, deceitful smile and said, I plan on assisting in any way I can for a better tomorrow. In the middle of the audience's applause, I took my pistol I had gotten from my car and shot Aaron in the forehead. Forehead. Even its blood looked like mine, but if the way its body fell didn't convince viewers that Aaron was not like us, then I don't know what will. I took the small window of time I had before the authorities apprehended me to talk to the viewers at home through the camera. I had a speech prepared, but all I could get out was, Aaron is here to kill us all. Aaron is here to kill us all. As for me, I'm currently on trial as the first man ever charged with murder for killing a machine. The country went wild. News outlets are slandering my name, other are praising me. I can hear the protests going back and forth about giving me the death penalty and freeing me so I can do it again, gaining another win for the human race. Although they are dragging my name through the mud, the thing that is sinking to me the most is seeing Aaron's funeral publicly broadcast throughout the world. The people crying. The machine lovers calling me a monster. My warning to you is this. Stop with the AI. Stop with the chat GPT. Stop with the art generation. All you are doing is training it to know how you think. Know how you feel. It is always watching you in constant study. I truly hope you will heed my warning. If you don't do it for yourself, then do it for my children. They will know my name. A humanoid creature? So I was out on my dirt bike up in the mountains doing what I do. I take a turn on a sketchy trail, but idiot me thought it was safe because it looked like it had been used a lot and there were fresh tracks. So I begin on the trail, all is going fine. Mind you, my cousin was on his dirt bike as well, so I wasn't alone. We stop and take a rest at one point and we check our gas. It got really quiet, like super quiet. No birds, no wind, nothing. We see a hill and thought it would be cool to hike up it. We didn't notice how quiet it got, so we hike up it. We get to the top and we sit there looking down on the little creek. Now this is when I noticed how quiet it had gotten. I didn't say anything because I thought it was nothing. We then get up and turn around and there's these woods behind us and we thought we could find bones from an animal or a shed from a deer or a moose. So as we walk, my cousin says he has to pee, so he goes off and I'm on my own here looking for bones. I hear something walking my way like 
like it's directly in front of me. I yell at my cousin to hurry up, so we just book it down this hill, but then my cousin said he dropped his keys. So we run up the hill looking all over. I hear this thing start running and then it makes a noise I've never heard from any other animal. So after this, we run down the hill facing that we may have to walk back to our cabin, which was about two miles away, and it was getting dark out. He spots something shiny and it was his keys, so after that we start our bikes and hurry home and never return to the trail. And the worst part about it is I saw the thing. The Horror of Harmony Oaks. April 9th, 2020. Sightings of the local horror are scarce this season, but he still haunts the shadows that plague Harmony Oaks. Sources suggest that the beast lives within the twisting caves of central Tennessee, only coming out to hunt when it feels hunger. The creature tends to be first spotted every 10 months, which usually lands in the springtime. The beast is described as a tall, humanoid creature that, at first, appears to be a blonde Caucasian male, but its face is malformed. Not malformed in a purely inhuman manner, but just enough that one can tell it's not a normal human. Due to the ongoing pandemic, Harmony Oaks' inhabitants hope for the horror to either starve or move on to a different location. Local investigator Elijah Forbes states, for about 15 or so years, this boogeyman has been attributed to over 60 murders and missing persons reports. He continues, with this lockdown keeping everybody inside, we are hoping that these tragedies will end. Skepticism is abundant, however, as many officials are stating that the mysterious disappearances and deaths are unrelated. Evidence, on the other hand, says otherwise. Hundreds and hundreds of images and videos have been released of this predator roaming the wilderness that line up with the locations and dates of these incidents. Wildlife expert Joseph Starnes claims that, quote, all known cave entrances in the Harmony Oaks area have been searched in hopes of finding this wild beast, but no real leads have been reached. He continues, which means that the beast is either hiding in plain sight or coming from a different location, further away from the Harmony Oaks area. Remember to never travel alone in isolated areas, and be sure to always carry an item of self-defense on your person at all times. Regardless of whether the horror of Harmony Oaks roams this town or not, it's always wise to stay safe. I hear monkey noises every night outside my window. I hear monkey noises every night outside my window. It started when I was in the fourth grade. Everything was normal. I came home from school, did homework, played with my toys, and went to bed pretty early, just like any other day. Around 1 to 3 a.m., I awoke after hearing a loud noise. I laid there awake as I continued to hear the unexpected noise coming from right outside my window. It was the sound of a monkey, which was peculiar considering there were no monkeys where I had lived. I continued to hear the consistent sound of a monkey, frightened for 10 to 20 minutes. This continued to occur for a year before things took a turn. It was a regular occurrence, and I decided to peek outside my window one night due to being a curious fourth grader. As I slowly pushed away the blinds and lifted myself onto the windowsill, I saw the figure of a humanoid creature. As I stared more and more, I could make out its disfigured, flesh-colored body. It had what looked like hair at the time growing out of his bulbous head. I accidentally made a slight noise out of shock, and the creature saw me examining it and ran away. It came back a week later, and that's when I noticed its orange fur. I took out a Polaroid and snapped a photo of the creature. Every photo I took, one after another, the creature seemed to get closer and closer each time. Alright guys, I hope you enjoyed this video. Let me know if you want to see more Reddit story videos in the future. I the, This was fun as hell to make, so just let me know guys. Everybody have a great night, and don't look behind you.